Let's pray as we go into the Word. Loving Father, thank you for your precious Word. Thank you for your Word, Lord. Thank you for your presence. You promise when two or three come together in your name that you're in the midst. And so, Lord, I know even now you're walking amongst us and you're working. You're in our lives. But there's some special anointing that comes into the room of your presence, a special manifestation of your presence when your people gather to worship you. And I pray that you'll release blessings throughout. Many folks here have needs, physical needs, maybe spiritual, emotional, mental needs. We have family. Oh, we have Wayne's sister, Sherry, and my daughter who struggle with Lyme disease. We have so many different needs. And in your presence, I pray that you would just let your kingdom come and the healing graces of heaven be released into each one of these lives to bless, to restore, to make whole. You are a God of miracles because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I thank you that you're here. Strengthen our faith and help us to go from faith to faith, from glory to glory, and to walk with you each day. In Jesus' name. As I was praying about what to preach this week, I had one thought that was coming through my mind, and, and, and it's a passage that I love. In fact, I, I made this the title of my sermon today. It's from the book of James, chapter 5. It says, Elijah was a man just like us. <laughs> and that's powerful. Just that one scripture. Elijah was a man just like us. When you think about Elijah, what that, that would indicate and what the possibilities are, right? So I'm going to read from James chapter 5. I'm going to begin with verse 13 just to pull a little context in. And we're going to read down here. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then you must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. The NIV says, Elijah was a man just like us. That's where I took it from. But Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth, and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. I love this passage. I love this truth that, that James talking about the presence of the Lord, the healing ministry of the Lord, and its availability to the church. Even now, it's availability to the church. And he goes to Elijah as an example, a man who saw many incredible signs and miracles and wonders. And he reminds the people, Elijah was a man just like us. In today's language, Elijah put his pants on just like the rest of us. Okay? He, he Sometimes... I think sometimes we forget that the people that we see in the Bible, it wasn't that they weren't set apart in a holy way, it was. You can look at Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha, and, and then go into the New Testament with Philip and Stephen and, and Peter and Paul, the different ones, and there's certainly a calling on their lives. But the Holy Spirit that was working in all these different people before Christ and after Christ is the same Holy Spirit that indwells every believer in Christ. Every believer. 
And when we forget that Elijah was a man just like us, we forget about the possibilities. The possibilities that it's true that for anybody, if we had, if we simply had the faith of a mustard seed, we could speak to a mountain and move it. And it's a struggle. I think that all of us have. How many times have you prayed? Have I prayed? I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I don't doubt God's power to heal. I don't doubt his, his ability to heal. And sometimes when there's been a delay, we, we, I start to wonder. I say, God, I believe you want to heal. I believe there's just something that's missing. Help me to believe not only that you can, because I do believe that, but help me to believe that you're willing and that you want to heal. And I do believe that too. I believe that, and I believe it always comes for the believer. Sometimes it comes on the other side. <laughs> Sometimes it comes on the other side, okay? Sometimes our healing is when we're with him in heaven. But he's always working, and he's always good. He's always good. And when we're not getting something that we're looking for, there's something that we're missing, I think. And there's so many different pieces of the puzzle that we try to understand and put together. I've been, as I was working through this sermon, I understand, I, I was thinking about my daughter-in-law. She's had several health issues. That Lyme disease flares up and causes different problems. So pray for her when she comes to mind. She could use it in prayer. And, and just, just having kind of a tough weekend. So this is heavy on the heart. And then I was, I was thinking of, of Wayne's sister Sherry and, and that they just lost the, her, her husband and, and the kids and the family and I just felt this heavy burden and, and the need the need for us to cry out to God I was thinking of some people that I've encountered at the stress center every week that I encounter at the stress center some that, that are angry at God, some that are just scared, some that are depressed and lonely, and many of them suicidal and giving up and feeling hopeless. And, and, and I have to go into each situation after spending some time with God. I have to connect with heaven because I know that if I go in my flesh, it won't make a difference. If they get my ministry, it will get my results, and that's not the results I want. That's not the results they need. <laughs> The bells of heaven are ringing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's phone is going off. Okay. <laughs> oh, goodness. I can't. Now, I'm thinking Jimmy Stewart, Miracle. And, oh, what, what, what's, the, what's the movie where that, that little girl gets her angel wings because of a bell? Which one was it? Miracle. Well, it's not Miracle. And that's where I started to go. Yeah, it's a different one. It's, it's, I'm blanking out. Everybody's going to be thinking of Jimmy Stewart. Okay. Thinking of, <laughs> but you know what I'm talking about, Jimmy Stewart? It's a wonderful life. There it is. There it is. Okay. So who got their angel wings? <laughs> Goodness. Talk about sidetrack. Uh, think about Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, in verse 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the sellers of Gilead, said to Ahab, okay, speaking of the king, as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go away from here and turn eastward and hide yourself. And so he, he, he goes to where the Lord sends him, and, and God commands the ravens to feed him bread and water in the morning and then the evening. And then the brook dries up and, and God sends him to Zarephath to a widow with, with her son. And, and, and uh, there God provides miraculous provision. She was, she was literally going out to gather up some sticks so she could use her last handful of flour and, and uh, the last part of oil and, and so that they could die. They were going to eat. She just thought, and, and, and Elijah said, no, go bake me some bread. <laughs> Bring it out to me and make some for yourself and your son. Because the Lord says, your flour and your oil will not uh, run out. And the oil will not dry out until it rains on the land. And we know there was three and a half years. Three and a half years of drought. 
Because Elijah spent time in the presence of the Lord, and the Lord spoke and commanded through Elijah that there would be this drought. Now, Elijah finally, I'm, I'm just summarizing a few things about Elijah's uh, ministry and his life. This widow whose son um, was, was living with them, the son got sick and he died. Right? And, and she brought him to Elijah. Elijah took him up in the room and laid on him three times and called him the Lord and, and said, Oh Lord, my God, I pray you let this child's life return to him. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, the life of the child returned, and he was revived. And Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed and it didn't rain. He spoke the words of God and the flour and the oil kept coming. He prayed and a young child was resurrected. In the third year, Elijah goes looking for Ahab because he's got a word for him. And Ahab's been looking all over the place for Elijah because he considers Elijah the reason why there's not, it's amazing. He doesn't stop and think, okay, Elijah was speaking at the word of God, but Elijah's the man responsible for the drought. He's looked all over the country trying to find this man. Finally, Elijah's ready to present himself. But he does so in a unique manner, and he has them call together the false prophets of Baal onto the Mount Carmel for, a, for an exhibition of God's power and glory. And the people of, of Israel gather and, and and the prophets of Baal and Asherah show up. There's like 450 prophets of Baal. I think it's 400 of Asherah. And, and, and the prophets of Baal, at, at Elijah's command, they make an altar. And, and both Elijah and them, they're going to build an altar. But the prophets of Baal make their altar. And, and they're, they're dancing around and calling on Baal to send fire, to burn up the wood on the altar and the sacrifice that's been laid there. But nothing happens. And they start cutting themselves. And Elijah starts mocking them. And, and all this stuff is going on. Finally, it comes time for Elijah. He, he, he goes and he, he lays the, the animal on, on, the, on the altar that he's built of the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he has four big buckets of water poured on. He says, do it again. Do it again. Three times. They're pulling the water down. The water's running down into this trench. And then he simply calls on God, on the name of the Lord. And fire falls out of the sky. And it licks up all the water. And the, that's the sacrifice and the wood. And, and, and the people fall down and say, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah was a man just like us. Elijah was a man just like us. It's the power of God working in his life, the presence of God. The Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians that the, the same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the Holy Spirit that indwells the believers. Same one. So what are we missing? What are we missing? We need to just keep going deeper into his presence. Deeper into his presence. The world needs us to go deeper into his presence so that we are walking with him in such a way that his love and his light are shining through us and blessing other people around us, that people are encountering his love because it's the only way they're going to be transformed. So many people have turned their backs on the hope that is their only hope, on, on Christ. But when they encounter the power of God through his people, it can awaken them in a moment. All of a sudden, something different has happened because they become aware of him. <laughs> I, I had a young lady, a young lady that um, asked me to bless her water. Okay, now this is a lady that doesn't really believe in God right now. And I think she may have been mocking a little bit, okay? And, and, uh, and I said, are you serious? You want me to bless your water? I said, if you're just messing around, I'm not interested. I said, are you serious? She said, well, yeah, I'm serious. Bless my water. I need healing. She doesn't need healing. She needs help. And I said, okay. I, I said, I'll, and I thought about it. I you know, I'll bless the water. Maybe the Lord will do something great for her. And, and, uh, so I prayed. I prayed over her water. And, um, and I still think she was horsing around, but I wasn't. 
Okay? And that's what she don't understand. Is I was not horsing around. I was putting the blessing of Christ on that and asking in the prayer, and she listened to my prayer, asking that she would encounter God, that she would encounter His love, that she would encounter His healing grace. Because I believe God cares that much. He really cares that much. But He needs for us to look at people and begin seeing them through His eyes and what it is He wants to do through us. And I think as long as there's breath in our body, there are people that He is wanting to touch. He is wanting to bless there are people that you are sitting with at the lunch table that are needing some encouragement. Maybe they're needing a prayer. Maybe they just need a listening ear. But they're needing a touch from heaven. I want to share, I, I don't know if, um, <laughs> it's Todd White. I don't know if you're familiar with Todd White. He has a ministry. He's an evangelist and travels around the world and he, and, and he he seems to have a real gift for receiving words of knowledge, if you will, special words from God. And, and, um, and we see these all through the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, where, where people receive special wisdom or they receive special words or even sometimes prophetic words, whatever you want to call them, but it's insight from heaven for a situation. All of a sudden, God invades. I want to play this testimony I came across the other day is so powerful because it, it demonstrates his willingness to carry Christ into a restaurant situation and into a situation where there's people there that don't love God, don't even believe in God. And I want you to see the power of God and what he can do in a moment when one person believes that the Holy Spirit is living in them and working and that he loves people and wants to make a difference. So I'm going to play this, this clip. It'll take a, a few minutes to, to, to watch, but I, I could tell you the story, but I just don't think I can do justice. So I, I want you to hear it for yourself. this place we used to go to, um, it was a steakhouse, and when we would get there, um, you know, there's peanuts on the floor, it's one of those kind of restaurants, and, and they take us to our table, and I remember going there, and my food is always cold, so whether I order it hot or not, it's always cold by the time I get to it, as I'm talking to waitresses and waiters and whatever, but at this point, we, we get our meal, or we're ordering our meal, a lady comes over and I... I told her how much Jesus loved her, and she gave me a, a serious attitude. And I told her, I said, well, God loves you, hon. I said, you know, you really can't get away from it. Even if you hate him, he still loves you. Well, I don't even want to talk to you. As a matter of fact, I'm going to get my manager. So she's angry. She's going to get her manager because her manager is going to let me have it. And this guy is an angry atheist, and he's just so mad. I just, just forgive me. I want to share this testimony before we start tonight. I have a lot of things I want to share, but this will go along with what Robert shared. And so he comes over and he goes, so, he goes, you want to talk about the Lord? And I'm like, oh, well, of course I do. And, and my wife is like, oh boy, like this guy's just going to, he's going to lay into us. And he's the manager guy. So he starts to lay into us and I start to share with him about how much God loves him. And he's just this professional debater, but so I'm done. I'm over debate. I don't, see, God is, the Holy Spirit is the best evangelist ever. I mean, my kids. Destiny and Zoe and Riley, they, they've all seen this. As I started to see this, and Asher, he's nine months, he will see this because that's just how we live. And so I start to share with this guy, and the waitress comes back, and she's like, uh-huh, yeah. Like she's, now she's really angry, and we didn't even place our order yet. So finally, this guy walks away. We placed our order with the lady, and she's still mad at me, and she's like, okay, great, whatever, and she walks away. And I'm thinking all the while, my gosh, I'm going to tip her. She's just going to be so blown away at us tipping her. And because the deal is, is that she doesn't deserve it. And grace is getting something that you don't deserve. You didn't earn it. You didn't earn the gospel. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. It's amazing. It's unmerited favor. It's undeserved favor. But um, grace is also the ability to be able to walk like Christ walked. Grace and truth. We can walk just like Jesus walked. And Jesus didn't give people what they deserved. If he did, we'd all be smoked and done. 
know, people say, well, if God loves me, then why? And like, well, then why did he do this? And why did he allow this? And why did he that way? If God didn't love you, you wouldn't be here right now. Like, no one asked that question. But we're sitting there and we're talking. And then the waitress comes back and she doesn't have her meal. She brings our drinks. And the other people that ordered, they got their meals. And they're almost done their meals before we've got our salad. And so this would cause you to get an attitude if you don't live with gratitude. Gratitude is thankfulness and loving Jesus with everything you are at all seasons, at all times, at all points, no matter where you're at, and knowing that you are there to represent him. And Robert said it, you know, John 3, 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave. So we're sitting there talking to her. She comes back out. I have a word about a word of knowledge about her. She walks away angry and the, and the manager comes back out and he's just letting me have it. And I said, man, I said, you know what I think? I said, I think you got hurt. He was hurt. No one could hurt me. And he's just real adamant about it. I said, no, I think you got hurt physically and I think you got hurt spiritually. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, you know what I think? I think you were going to college. I said, and you tore an ACL. And because of that tear, you got angry at God and said, God took this. God did this. And you're just angry. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, were you going to college to get this? Well, yes. Yeah, so what? And I said, man, I said, did your knee get tore? I said, did you blame God? He goes, well, I don't know. I said, well, I believe Jesus wants to heal your knee. He goes, well, I don't believe in healing. I don't believe in miracles. As a matter of fact, I think you're fake. And I think this and I think that. And I said, that's okay. It doesn't matter to me. I said, you don't have to think that I'm real. I said, but I want you to do me a favor. I want you to let me pray for you. And then we'll find out what's real. If he's not real, then he won't heal your knee. Period. I said, did your knee, did you tear your knee? He said, yeah. I said, did you tear your ACL? He said, yeah. I said, did it stop you from going to college to go to the sport that you wanted to go? He said, yeah. I said, okay, let me pray for you. He goes, well, nothing's going to happen. I said, well, we can do this here or we can go in the back. Whatever you want to do, I don't mind. Either way. And she's like, well, let's go over here. I don't want to do this out here where everybody's at. I said, all right, let's go. So I went in the back, uh, not in the back back, but right down by the back of the place and at a table where no one was at. And I said, now I'm going to pray for your knee. I said, you can unbelieve all you want, and Jesus is going to heal it because he loves you. And he says, well, I don't believe that. I said, well, okay, you tell me when you're ready and you're in the unbelief that you think is strong enough to stop this from happening. And it sounds funny because like, people are like, well, no one can be that confident. I beg to differ. Like, your unbelief can't stop God from flowing through me. You, you can think what you want. You can be taught what you want. I've just seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people get healed that were in unbelief. I've actually challenged people just like this and told him, get in the most unbelief. Let me know when you're ready. He said, go ahead. He's just good and angry. You think there ain't no way he's in unforgiveness. He's definitely in bitterness. He's definitely in anger. He definitely has some rage going on. He's sweating and he's angry at me for challenging him. And that waitress is watching and she's his cheerleader because he's the top atheist guy. And we're in a restaurant that we're supposed to be getting a meal at. So this is totally awkward. And so I looked at him. I said, are you ready? He goes, go ahead. So I pray for his knee. So Father, I thank you. I ask you to show him how much you love him. Knee, be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And I just sat back. I didn't say a word. And I looked at him. He looked at me. And I saw the anger go away. And I saw his face turn red. Now, he could have been red from anger, but he was red from embarrassment. I asked him, I'm on my knees in the peanuts, praying for his name. And he looks at me, and he goes, what's going on right now? I said, you tell me. He said, there's electricity in my knee. I said, well, that's crazy. What do you think that is? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I need you to step up, stand up, bend down, squat, check it, see if it pops anymore, and see if it's healed. He looks at me, he goes, what if I don't want to? I said, you can go ahead and do whatever you want to, man. I said, but here's the deal. You're going to know by the end of tonight whether it's healed or not. And I'm not trying to prove you wrong. I'm just trying to represent that God still loves you even though you're standing there in hate with him. He looks at me and he goes, okay, wise guy. He stood down. He got up. He goes, oh, my God. I said, that's right, buddy. He's my God. He's your God. I said, I don't want anything from you. What I need you to know is that God's not mad at you. So why would you be mad at him? He looked at me and he goes, you don't understand. You just don't understand. I said, what don't understand? He goes, I was a youth pastor and I was working at a church as a youth pastor. He said, and it was my, it was my pride and joy. And I'm over all these kids and the head pastor, he, he had an affair and cheated on his wife with somebody from the congregation. And I, I lost everything. 
everything, man. Everything. Everything. And then I and then I, I like I'm looking back at my knee and God stopped me from this. And I said, if God stopped me from that, why well, I'll be healing you now. I said, You had an accident, buddy. I said, God doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. The thief does. I said, Jesus came and he healed everyone that came to him. I said, Come on, God. That's I mean, come on, man, that's not God. He looked at me and he goes, Man, I, I, I've been really ignorant to you. I go, I don't need your apology. I'm okay. If you want to say you're sorry for you, that's good, but I love you. I don't need you to love me back. And I shared my testimony with him. He looked at me and he goes, I, I have no idea. He goes, I, I need to apologize to your wife. I said, you can. I said, but I'm telling you right now, God loves you, man. That pastor that cheated on his wife and ruined your dream of being a youth pastor. God doesn't take the call away from your life because someone else ruins theirs. God loves you. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance, man. I said, Jesus still has a call for you. I said, he wants you to actually lead people. I said, now you will lead atheists. I think those things have changed. He looks at me and he goes, you ain't kidding, man. Because I have a lot to talk about. Like his wife, everybody. All that, his kids. He looks at me and he goes, man, I, I don't know what to say. I said, you know what I'm saying? God, just give you a hug. Gave him a hug. And the waitress was like, oh my God. And she walked in the back. Like she, was, she had no, like, she had no leader anymore. It was so crazy. So went back to the table and our food, of course, came out cold and, uh, and everything. We get to the end, the waiter came out and he said he was sorry. And then he walked away. And the waitress came out at the end of our meal. She looked at me and she goes, I really don't know what to say. I said, well, we'd like the bill if it's okay. She goes, sure. She gave me the bill. She goes, I'll see you later. She walked away. And I saw the bill. I think it was like 120. And I, I'm pretty sure we doubled it. So we tried to double our tip. We tried to double our bill with the tip. Now, we don't go out to eat a lot. But we try to make sure that when we tell people about Jesus, they know we're radically generous because God so loved the world that he gave. And it works really well with very angry, hateful people because they can't get away from them. Because, see, money, money rules this world. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not the root of all evil. The love of it is. If I need money, if I have to love money to make my life okay, I've, now that's the root of everything evil, all kinds of selfishness, all kinds of hoarding, all kinds of horrible, horrible stuff is in there. But money can be used in the, in the place of bringing people to Jesus. And so when you go out to eat and when you have a hateful waitress or a hateful waiter, you bless their socks off, they don't know what to do. And it's totally amazing and it changes the course of a whole night. So we tipped her and uh, she she took the bill or she took the thing. She goes, thank you. She walked in the back and we're out the table because we're still finishing some stuff. She goes, my gosh. She goes, sir, you made a mistake. She goes, this ain't right. Look, you, you. I said, no. I said, you're not a mistake. She looks at me. She goes, you can't do this. I said, I can. She goes, you have to take that back. She goes, I don't deserve this. <laughs> That's my favorite. I don't deserve what I have either. Jesus paid the price to give us something that none of us deserve. None of us earned this. We didn't earn the gospel. I didn't earn salvation. I didn't perform for it. I didn't. He paid the price to give it to me because God so loved the world that he gave. And he asked me to believe I was that selfish, angry, hateful, criticizer. I was that guy. I was that adamant atheist arguing my point, making people look bad so that I would look good. I was that guy. And then Jesus completely changed it. She said, you can't do this. I said, well, we did. And we really want to bless you. See, grace is something that you didn't earn. And tonight, if I were to tip you because of your performance, you weren't expecting a penny at all. You were expecting to work for free. I said, but your tip at this table was bigger probably than any of your other tables. I'm not boasting in our tip. I'm boasting in the grace of God towards your life because God so loved you that he gave a son. And she looked at me and she goes, I don't know what to say. I said, you don't have to say anything. I said, we bless you and I hope you have a great evening. Jesus loves you. And so we, we get known at restaurants through blessing people. Through they, they, Some of the restaurants we go to always give us the new people. They give us the new waiter and they get dumbfounded like, 
Like, what is happening here? Uh, honestly, we need to live that life everywhere we go and everything we do. We need to be known as radically generous people. You know, it starts with knowing how radically good and how generous our God is and how amazing our King is. I really like the testimony that Todd shared because I am, again, he's a, he's a man, he's a person just like you and me, and he has the Holy Spirit to dwell in, and he's sensitive to opportunities. And what, what got me is how many of us, if we had a, a waitress that was that turned off, you know, a manager that was that angry, we just we just give up. We wouldn't even wouldn't even sit in the presence of God. What is He doing in this situation? He wasn't going to argue with the man, but he was tuning in to Lord. What do you want to do in the moment? And he had a thought about the man's need, and because he went forward and took a chance and shared what he thought was from the Lord, this man ends up healed. But not just healed physically, but spiritually. His life is transformed. His life is transformed. He will never be the same again because of that encounter with God. A man goes from atheist, really, from a foot in hell to completely transformed because one Christian person believed that the power of God, the presence of God, was in him and loves these people and wants to make a difference in their life. That waitress, I don't know what happened to the waitress, but I'm pretty sure she'll never forget the tip that she got. I'm pretty sure she'll never forget the transformation she saw take place in her boss because one man was willing to carry the presence of God and not really be bothered by whether or not somebody was offended to be told that God loves them. You know, he, he's willing to see. we got to see past the barriers that people put up. I pray all the time, God, help me to see these people for what they can become instead of where they're at. Because believe me, when you look at the, the simple lives and the bondage that so many people are in, it, it's, it's sad, it's frustrating, it's, it's, I think of the passage that says, hating even the, the clothing stained, stained with corrupted flesh. I mean, it's repulsive sometimes. But also then, if you get to know the people, you find the pain. I have some of the most some of the people that I encounter that are so deeply lost have had some of the greatest pain that I've ever heard in my life. The abuse, molestations, the rapes, the, the horrible things that happen in their childhood. And, and God sees all of it. He knows it's there and he wants his love to break through the darkness. But I think we really have to believe that the Holy Spirit in us is able and willing to work in all of us so that we are willing to let him have those opportunities for us. He uses the people. This is the way the church is. The arms, the feet, the mouth, the, you know, we're the different parts. Jesus is the head, but he's directing each one of us. But he needs every person, as long as there is breath in our body, to be present and to say, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me, bless through me, love through me. Help me to shine your love and light to other people. Salt them with your presence. God wants to make a difference in our lives. And for me, part of that is realizing, you know, I'm a man just like Elijah. And Elijah was a man just like me. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He healed and did miracles from the very beginning. You can see incredible things that God did all through the Old Testament. He healed and he did miracles in the ministry of Jesus and the ministry of the early church. 
He took people like Philip and Stephen that were set apart to wait tables as deacons. And, and, and he went out and started doing miracles and sharing the gospel. And Philip became an evangelist. And God is just looking for people that will say, here I am, Lord, work in me. And then he'll give us whatever gifts we need in a moment. But we need to allow ourselves to be in the presence of other people and to be willing to take that if I offer to pray for somebody, they could get offended. It's rare. It really is rare that I actually get offended because it shows concern. But they could. But they could also go back to their room at night and, and lay in bed and think about the fact that they said God loves me and they offered to pray and the Holy Spirit won't let them get it out of their heads. You understand? I believe God's still working. I believe he'll work on that waitress. She'll probably go home and think about that tip. Every time she goes to work, she'll go think about that massive tip that she got from this, this man who blessed her. He planted seeds in her heart. What will you allow God to do in your life? Who in your life is still needing Jesus and needing a touch or even just needing a, his healing miracle? I want to share one more thing. This scripture was also running through my mind. The Lord's Prayer, when Jesus said, we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what does that mean? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm pretty sure God's will is done perfectly in heaven. Okay? And we know that the kingdom of heaven is powerful. The angels are doing his bidding. We know that there's healing, there's perfection in heaven. And Jesus says we are to pray that God would bring that to the earth. His kingdom, his presence, his ministry, his will being worked out. We're inviting his presence. Jesus said, if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come among you. He wants his presence to manifest through his people. He wants his love to be experienced and encountered through his people. God is love. It's at the heart of his kingdom. Will you love people when they feel unlovable, when they're grumpy and grouchy and hard to be around? Will you look at them and see beyond what you see on the surface and realize there's some pain in their lives that has probably helped to shape that part of those people. And it's the thief who came to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came that we would have life and life more abundantly. And God wants to hold that life out through his people. An invitation to come, to receive his love, to drink of his presence, to fellowship with him. We're going to pray. I invite you, if you want to, extend your hands like you're receiving from the Lord, because I'm going to ask Him to bless you. Father, I just pray for each person here that you would release a blessing, a deep blessing, a beautiful blessing, a heavenly blessing. I pray for family and friends and people, even acquaintances, people around us who need to know you. May each person here, may we all show your love. May we all show your kindness and your grace. May we all hold up the good news of Christ. May we be sensitive to the thoughts that you give us so that we're willing to, to speak and share whatever you've given us to bless and help other people come to know you. May we be generous with other people so that we'll encounter your love. We need you in your presence, Lord. Your presence. It's with us always, but God, we need to live in awareness. Now, I thank you, God, for hearing this prayer and for your presence, for your blessings. And God, if there are any here who have not said to Jesus, I want to follow you for the rest of my life, if not repent of their sins and baptize into you, Come in faith and receive you. I pray that they will do that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you need any special ministry, you've got to.
some prayer needs. Um, we just need to talk about something. Wait, wait me down, and um, we'll talk. But thank you for being here today. Blessings to you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Donna. We'll get this off so I'll be ready. Master. <laughs> How are you? Good. 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 I, 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 
I got, they didn't, I did have to go this week. They got stuff because they asked me to go. Because they, 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 they had a, 